So let's start with picture number one, and it's oft uh, forgotten when you do these type of uh, conferences, uh, the market capitalization of uh, various market segments in global financial markets. So obviously, fixed income markets, it is the big market, and out of fixed income markets, only 0.5% roughly is in green bonds. So whenever we're talking about climate and ESG and we're thinking that we're going to do that in fixed income and we're saying it's just going to be green bonds, um, that's uh, actually a mistake. Um, the background to the paper I've written uh, is uh, actually you know, a portfolio problem. Uh, I'm a trader. I wrote a book once upon a time when I was back at Barclays Capital. Uh, I was doing lots of synthetic credit back then, um, and we were looking at curve trades. And curve trades is one of those things that is extremely nice to express views in terms of timing of when events are going to materialize. Um, I'm highlighting here on, on, on the figure, and I'll see if this works. So it's actually a cash bond curve, and uh, a cash bond curve down here, and it's a CDS curve for the same issuer. And there are some you know, almost arbitrageable conditions here where you can see that front-end CDS is actually trading at the same spread levels as long-dated bonds. To me, as a trader, that means that I can actually sell protection, I can be long risk on the CDS leg, and I can short the long-dated bonds. Now, this is from, a, from an, a big petroleum company. So this is, for me, also a potential way to express a, a view, a negative view on petroleum companies. Um, and I want to be able to do that, and I want to have a management system that actually tells me, is this a green trade or is it not a green trade, depending on the weights I put on it. So a very simple presentation of the paper um, using these very simple Venn diagrams. I'll go to the case C immediately. Uh, I'm trying to represent here uh, A as an unconstrained opportunity set in terms of invest investments. It's just you have no rules whatsoever. Uh, a lot of the marketing material in green finance actually tells you that once we go green, we have this wholly different opportunity set. And that's just obviously logically not correct. An unconstrained investor can always follow the green investment strategy if, uh, if they wish to. So that C case is something we, we cross over. Now, whenever we apply ESG constraints, we actually reduce the opportunity set of where you know, the portfolio manager can invest. And the question becomes, are we in case A or in case B? In case A here, uh, the constrained investment set is almost as big as the unconstrained, which means that the portfolio manager can generate the returns they want to with a very little sort of friction. Now, uh, in case B, it's quite different. You know, they can trade parts of the market. That means they can make as much money, and it's, uh, it's a significant difference in that case. So the paper tries to first define you know, this investment set, e, is it an E1 or E2? And then it tries to measure uh, the difference between this unconstrained opportunity set and the constrained one and say, you know, is, is this actually making a big significant impact when we try to go green? In practice, and a couple of things that I wanted to achieve when I also uh, started doing this, uh, from my experience on the trading desk, is the fact that you know, need that to have the system uh, to be parsimonious. It needs to be simple so people can actually understand it. I mean, most credit traders are from Liverpool and probably have you know, uh, a couple of teeth lacking. It's still how the market actually looks out there. If you're going to get buy-in uh, from some of these people, it actually needs to be fairly simple. But that also goes into robustness, because this needs to be happening in real time. You can't have a portfolio or a climate impact system that gives you a score six months later or 12 months later because it's entirely useless for someone trying to make decisions here and now and today in terms of generating, uh, generating alpha. Lastly, it needs to be non-green arbitrageable. What I mean by that is, you know, having worked at Barclays Capital uh, before the financial crisis, I know that we can figure out how to arbitrage almost any system. So if you give us a little bit of a loophole in terms of taking on a position that looks green or doesn't give me brown exposure, we'll find that loophole and we're actually going to use it as much as possible. So the system needs to be uh, uh, trying to avoid that. An example here, for example, would be, you know, um, how do you treat nominal positions in bonds? So if I buy 10 million on ExxonMobil bonds, what's the CO2 footprint of uh, the two-year bonds versus the 30-year bonds? In a lot of systems, they would equate those uh, positions, 
which is obviously completely wrong when you look at it from a credit risk perspective. And ExxonMobil, they'd much rather have 10 million from you for 30 years than two years. So, uh, this is what the system, and this is from a, a, a publication called uh, Credit Flux, um, what, what the sort of system looks like. It's nothing really fancy about this, just trying to keep it sort of um, uh, non-parametric. So, we start out with a big portfolio of bonds. All these bonds have issuers, and we take those issuers and we look at uh, what's the carbon intensity, uh, intens uh, intensity of each of these issuers. We can split all of the bonds across their sectors, so we will have something which is called the low emission sectors, the medium, and the high emission sectors. So your oil companies would be up here, and your you know, telcos would be down here. Um, so everything gets a one, two, and three based on their sector allocation. Secondly, we look within each sector and we rank all the companies within the sector based on how carbon intense they are for as much capital they're actually uh, using. Um, and you rank it as a high, middle or bottom, you know, three-tiered type of uh, ranking within each, uh, within each sector. Then you simply multiply these two numbers. So I told you this was going to be extremely simple. But you just multiply, uh, which means that you get something between one and nine. So that's the basic scaling of, of the system here. Now we do a little thing uh, extra, where we say that anything that's a green bond is gonna get the score of zero. So a low score is good, a uh, high score is bad, right? Um, the green bonds get zero flags. We do the same thing when it comes to CDS positions. Um, which just says we are equating a CDS position, a synthetic credit position, with uh, owning a bond. We also uh, do a trick where we say, okay, if we go short Exxon mobile bonds, for example, we go from nine to one. So it's just inverting the score, essentially. Very basic. Um, and the last bit that we're trying to do is you know, get around this sort of, uh, uh, well, it's a very traditional credit view. You actually use uh, duration to weight each of the uh, positions in the portfolio. So if it has a big contribution of risk into the portfolio through this duration measure, then it's going to have a big impact in terms of uh, how much it affects your score. Now, this is not the structural model. It doesn't give you carbon footprint of 156.7 tons. But you know, I don't think we have the methodology to actually do that properly for any asset class so far. Even a simple thing like you know, deciding how much of CO2 should be allocated to the equity side of the balance sheet and how much should be on the debt side, we don't have a really good key for that. So the ordinal approach I use here, just having a scoring, is, is something which you know, works uh, uh, pretty well from, from you know, trying to shift you, the direction of your portfolio, at least. Um, this just goes through uh, the, 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 the detail of this. Uh, what I'm working with here essentially is a Fortune 500 company. It's slightly dated, uh, older data from CDP, uh, but it's more as a you know, test benchmark for, uh, for some of the you know, larger cap structures that we have out there. Uh, and uh, sophistication will obviously be to improve data and data sets and so on in the next version. Um, the risk weighting I already spoke about, um, and I'm not going to go through too much about uh, carbon, uh, uh, the carbon part of it. Now, one thing that is extremely important, and that again gets, goes back to this original uh, uh, discussion, you know, where I showed how big the green bond market is vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the market. You have to realize that also when it comes to within the general bond market, where we actually have a proper carbon footprint is, well, obviously it's going to be bigger in the high emission sectors, but the magnitude of the emissions associated with those sectors is just massive compared to what we do here. Now, a problem that some of the you know, ESG or SRI funds have is that they actually go and say, okay, we're gonna reduce our carbon footprint, so we invest in these sectors. And, you know, that's not very constructive, right? I mean, I think that some of the big transition stories we actually need to see actually ha needs to happen within the high energy sectors, the high emission sectors, and also the relative shift of capital between you know, good petroleum companies and bad petroleum companies, that's where a lot of the difference actually can be made. And that's where we as portfolio managers also can have even more impact than you know, buying uh, extremely low carbon type of uh, naturally companies. 
Um, <clears throat> we do something else here uh, as well. Uh, if you jump at some of the return numbers I'm going to show later on, just remember that this allows us to also account for leverage uh, within the book. So this book was run by almost three, three and a half terms of leverage, um, net leverage at, at the peak. Um, and you know, for me, designing a hedge fund strategy, obviously leverage is going to be essential in order to actually generate, generate returns. Again, if you have a system that doesn't account for leverage or does something stupid about it, then you're going to disincentivize portfolio managers to actually uh, look at you know, the real climate impact of their portfolios. Um, this score allows us to, you know, this system allows us to actually generate the score uh, over time. Uh, I'm just showing these graphs to show that you can actually implement it and you know, get the numbers out of your portfolio. Um, I think the, the, the next key graph that you want to think about in the paper, and by the way, if you want to download the paper, I think you can Google just Ulf and CO2, and I'll be like, you know, uh, there aren't that many Ulfs, um, many Ulfs in the business. Uh, you'll find it there. Um, so this, this graph here highlights the solid line is excess return that we generated on the credit portfolio at AP4 for this special subset. So it was a very strong per, uh, performance over this time. Um, and on this side, we actually have the echo bar score of, of, of the portfolio. So this goes from a four, which would be the sort of expectation neutral level, and then it actually greens up quite significantly. And you have some discontinuities here, because sometimes you take a big, big position in a green bond, and that will actually affect the score quite substantially. We had fantastic risk limits at AP4, so you could actually move around things quite a lot. Now, once we have the time series here, and my background really when I did my PhD was in, in, in time series, um, we actually can start doing some tests with regards to this. So I want to test you know, this basic hypothesis. When I'm applying this echo bar uh, methodology, uh, and I'm not even targeting anything here, I'm just uh, looking at it, does it actually affect my uh, opportunity to generate alpha? Can I actually correlate these two variables? And it looks, you know, originally I thought, this looks like we could say, you know, I greened my portfolio, I made money from that. However, when we underthrow you know, a couple of econometric tests on this, we realize that no, that's not the case. Uh, it's actually not correlated. Uh, now, that might seem like a negative statement, but I actually think it's quite powerful because what you're saying is that, okay, as a portfolio manager, you actually have two goals that you can optimize on, and they are not related. So you can actually try to generate alpha, which is hard, and it's a skill, uh, and you're wanting to do that as unconstrained as possible, but you can also green up your portfolio without losing lots of you know, the potential on the other side, what you're optimizing on. I don't believe in the story that you, know, you can just like buy green stuff and then you're gonna make, uh, make do on that. You, it's so counterfactually easy to show that that's not gonna be the case. Look at high yield in the US 2015 and 16. If you weren't in the evil companies in the US high yield sector in 2016, i.e. the shale gas guys, you were uh, likely to be fired by the end of the year because you were underperforming by 15, 20% versus the index. Um, so that, uh, that was my historical performance from AP4. I run it with a, a strategy that I developed at uh, uh, Barclays Capital as well to you know, have another sort of road test. What I do here is, it's, is you essentially create a portfolio long short of CDS. Um, and then we test, okay, so if we throw out everything on the long risk side, that means I don't allocate capital to the bad guys, the six and nines of the echo bar, does that actually affect performance? And uh, no, it doesn't. Okay, so you can you know, trade the oil sector, but you shouldn't be trading ExxonMobil. That's essentially what, what that strategy suggests. And you can still have a significant greening of your portfolio. So that's, that's essentially the, 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 the gist of the paper. There's some interesting implementations of this. We've created a low carbon bond index on the back of this together with uh, S&P, Dow Jones indices. Um, there's some funky stuff you can start doing with like traded products like CDS indices, massive volume going through in CDS indices, you can just adjust them to have a better echo bar score and do it in a way that actually is having an effect on the underlying credits and cost of capital. And some interesting things to do there. Um, 
Now, where I think I would have, you know, uh, future points of research, financials is obviously something that we have a hard time, and there was a great session here before where we start looking at, you know, what actually goes on in banks and their balance sheets. It's not very well covered in this type of model. Um, I also mentioned you know, the cost of capital. What's a hybrid bond versus a senior bond versus a covered bond versus a loan? Um, and then we also should look at the fixed income space as all this sovereign debt, quasi-sovereign debt, everything that's not traded in public equity market, which is actually 60% of the largest CO2 emitters are not traded in equities. So I'll, I'll finish up with, you know, um, not a lighter note, if you put it that way. Um, what's going on in markets today? Sometimes you, you feel hope, okay? But that's not very often, and especially not when you see something like this in, in beginning of June, where uh, uh, Australia actually uh, okayed what you know, the Rolling Stone magazine calls the world's most insane energy project. It's the Carmichael mine, one of the biggest coal mines this uh, planet has ever seen. And it's leading to the excavation of the Galilee Basin, which is roughly 7 billion tons of CO2, which again is roughly 25 to 30 billion, billion tons of, um, of uh, CO2 emissions. Now, that's roughly 10% of the remaining carbon budget. This is being financed. They are issuing bonds. They are issuing bonds into, the, uh, into the global financial markets. You can go in and get the list of who buys this one. And then you should actually consider what is going on in fixed income when people are even allocating in 2019 uh, money to this type of uh, project. Um, and that concludes. Follow me on LinkedIn. I discuss stuff like that uh, on there. Thank you.